You'll hear three different extracts. For questions one to six, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract one. You overhear two friends, Gordon and Annabel, discussing a film called A Secret Place, which they have both seen recently. Now look at questions one and two. Annabel, you saw a secret place the other day, didn't you? I did. Interesting, but the action's very patchy. It falls apart here and there.、Mm, there isn't a thread you can follow all the way through, is there? I can see what the director Yoshiki、um, Muto. Yeah, I, I can see what he's trying to do. It's a complex layering of detail, but it just doesn't come off. Well, it's a brave attempt. It works for me, although I have to say I still really prefer the original novel with its very delicate touch.、Mm. I think though the film version taps into our emotions more. But what about the ending? I'd have enjoyed it more if it hadn't been for that powerful, pounding rock music, which was obviously supposed to emphasize what was happening on screen.、Mm. But I did like the way I was on the verge of laughing, then almost crying for that final two or three minutes. Very well done. Not that it really appeared to sort anything out for our hero. Presumably, he'll turn up in a sequel soon with the same old dilemma. <laughs> we'll look forward to that then. Now you'll hear the recording again. Annabel, you saw a secret place the other day, didn't you? I did. Interesting, but the action's very patchy. It falls apart here and there.、Mm, there isn't a thread you can follow all the way through, is there? I can see what the director、um, Yoshiki Muto. Yeah, I, I can see what he's trying to do. It's a complex layering of detail, but it just doesn't come off. Well, it's a brave attempt. It works for me, although I have to say I still really prefer the original novel with its very delicate touch.、Mm. I think though the film version taps into our emotions more. But what about the ending? I'd have enjoyed it more if it hadn't been for that powerful, pounding rock music, which was obviously supposed to emphasize what was happening on screen.、Mm. But I did like the way I was on the verge of laughing, then almost crying for that final two or three minutes. Very well done. Not that it really appeared to sort anything out for our hero. Presumably, he'll turn up in a sequel soon with the same old dilemma. <laughs> we'll look forward to that then. Extract two. You hear part of a radio interview with an architect called Alan Fassman. Now look at questions three and four. So, Alan, what's the best way to get good public architecture? Well, people don't want to be challenged by architecture. That's understandable in a way. I'm not one for saying necessarily that public buildings are an appropriate area where people should have a vote to say that this building should go ahead or not. Many of our greatest and most glorious buildings wouldn't exist if that happened. Take St Paul's Cathedral in London. At the time, people were very antagonistic and hated its horrid foreign style. Now everyone adores it. It's a landmark, a sort of emblem of the city that wouldn't have existed if public opinion had had its way. Do other countries do better than us, either in terms of imagination or in terms of the kind of decision making we've been talking about? Yes, they do. In recent history, anyway. The Netherlands is a prime example. A number of the world's leading architects happen to come from there. But the important thing is that the people are very knowledgeable. They learn about architecture in school. They do have a good record for town planning as well, but that's hardly the point. Now you'll hear the recording again. So, Alan, what's the best way to get good public architecture? Well, people don't want to be challenged by architecture. That's understandable in a way. I'm not one for saying necessarily that public buildings are an appropriate area where people should have a vote to say that this building should go ahead or not. Many of our greatest and most glorious buildings wouldn't exist if that happened. Take St Paul's Cathedral in London. 
At the time, people were very antagonistic and hated its horrid foreign style. Now everyone adores it. It's a landmark, a sort of emblem of the city that wouldn't have existed if public opinion had had its way. Do other countries do better than us, either in terms of imagination or in terms of the kind of decision making we've been talking about? Yes, they do. In recent history, anyway, the Netherlands is a prime example. A number of the world's leading architects happen to come from there. But the important thing is that the people are very knowledgeable. They learn about architecture in school. They do have a good record for town planning as well, but that's hardly the point. Extract three. You hear part of a radio interview with the ecologist Lorna Hindle about climate change. Now look at questions five and six. Why did you decide to publicise climate change in this way? Well, I was really upset about some countries' failure to sign up to pollution agreements. It felt like the science wasn't getting through to the politicians, so I decided to look into what I personally could do. That led me to dream up a cartoon character called Mr. Carbon. We all know somebody like him. He's climate ignorant and makes no effort to save energy. Factories are the obvious villains, of course. But I couldn't do much about them. So, are we going to see him in scenes like we get in disaster movies? Oh, that's pretty unlikely. You need a lot of alarmist nonsense to make a box office success. But the reality certainly gives cause for concern. So, you came up with the idea of another cartoon character, Mrs. Green. Yes. Now she pays attention to little things. Uses low energy light bulbs. Doesn't leave the TV on standby. Goes in for recycling. And can you believe it? As well as making a huge difference to her climate impact, she'll save a hundred and fifty thousand dollars over her lifetime. That's incredible. Now you'll hear the recording again. Why did you decide to publicise climate change in this way? Well, I was really upset about some countries' failure to sign up to pollution agreements. It felt like the science wasn't getting through to the politicians, so I decided to look into what I personally could do. That led me to dream up a cartoon character called Mr. Carbon. We all know somebody like him. He's climate ignorant and makes no effort to save energy. Factories are the obvious villains, of course, but I couldn't do much about them. So, are we going to see him in scenes like we get in disaster movies? Oh,、well, that's pretty unlikely. You need a lot of alarmist nonsense to make a box office success, but the reality certainly gives cause for concern. So you came up with the idea of another cartoon character, Mrs. Green. Yes. Now she pays attention to little things, uses low energy light bulbs, doesn't leave the TV on standby, goes in for recycling, and can you believe it? As well as making a huge difference to her climate impact. She'll save a hundred and fifty thousand dollars over her lifetime. That's incredible. That's the end of part one.